progresses in the book of 2 Samuel. And between chapters 13 and 19, we have the stories of um, Absalom, centered around Absalom and David. Now, Absalom was one of David's sons. Um, now, last week, you, uh, you would have heard about the whole saga of David and Bathsheba and Uriah. Now, from this point on, the book kind of tells us that a downward spiral in David's life. Uh, things are not going well, especially with Absalom. Now, Absalom was, as we said, one of the sons. And from the very start, it feels like he wants to mimic his father, David. Now, we only read a few verses, but let me, um, allow me to give you a little um, gist on, on, on his, the whole narrative. It's a few chapters, but I'll point out a few things from these chapters. Second Samuel chapter 13 is where Absalom is introduced um, in a very revengeful narrative, right? That uh, the story here is of Tamar, who is Absalom's sister, and um, one of their own brothers um, violates um, Tamar, and Absalom, who is um, Tamar's own brother, retaliates, and he goes to the extent of uh, executing all of them. It is here that we see that uh, we see a first glimpse of Absalom's mimicry. In verse 27 of 2 Samuel uh, 13, it says, Absalom made a feast like the king's feast. He is not the king. He wants to be the king. Now, we, we, we see further shades of this in Absalom's mimicry um, in, verse, in, in chapter 15, uh, verse 4 to 6, where Absalom says, If only I were judge in the land, then all who had a suit or cause might come to me, and I would give them justice. Whenever people come near me to do obeisance to him, to me, uh, I would put out my hand and take hold of them and kiss them. All the things that a king would do. And, and the scripture says, Thus Absalom did to every Israelite who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the people of Israel. There is more that Absalom does. In the following chapters, which is uh, 14 and 15, he actually organizes a coup, uh, something like what's happening in some of our countries, and takes over the kingdom from David and makes David flee. He gets his own army together and goes against David and usurps the throne. At this point, the writer introduces Absalom, right? 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 25 and 26. Now in all Israel, there was no one to be praised so much for his beauty as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. When he cut the hair of his head, listen to this closely, when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. So apparently he had very beautiful hair, which was probably thick. Now, as we come to the story today, it is in fact a very tragic event, but also comical in some sense, the way he died. Uh, so David finally wants to go up against Absalom. He gets his people together and pursues Absalom and his people into a forest. Now, as the text that we read says, the forest killed a lot more people because I, it, it, was, it was probably a very thick forest and uh, they were not able to move well. Little did Absalom know that his strength of his hair would turn out to be his weakness. In the reading today, Absalom is on a mule, which is a small donkey, and during battle, he gets stuck between a tree, right? And while the mule under him runs on. So he is riding on, he gets stuck under the tree. The writer wants us to see that it's this beautiful hair of his that made him get stuck between this tree and left him hanging. 
the NRSV says, as we read today, he was hanging between heaven and earth as David's army came and struck him down. Absol Absalom's mimicry is something we probably shouldn't aspire to pattern ourselves after. Absalom saw David, heard David, heard about David, and wanted to be like David. However, his cunningness in attempt to use mimicry to usurp the Lord's anointed does not present a good example for us. But in spite of this, the word of God through David comes through in this passage where in the end when he hears of Absalom being killed, he says, O oh Absalom, O oh Absalom, my son, O oh that I may have died in your place. Our gospel passage, John chapter 6. The first few chapters of John tell us something about the signs that Jesus did. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, we uh, see a lot of miracles, right? Miracle narratives, but John has it differently. John points to certain signs. And over here in our reading in John chapter 6, the sign is that Jesus is the bread of life. Now for the Jewish listener, this was not too strange. In, indeed, as evidenced in a few chapters in the Old Testament, Exodus, Numbers, and a couple of Psalms, the Messiah was expected to reproduce the miracle of feeding or giving the manna, right? If you look at John chapter 6, that is the story. Jesus feeds the 5,000. After that story, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But why then did the Jews react in the way they did? If you look closely, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever will come to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Isn't it fascinating that here is someone who says that if you come to me, you will never be hungry or thirsty. But look at where the Jews wanted to lay the emphasis. They took it up with him saying, how can he say he is the bread of life? Isn't he the son of Joseph and Mary? The emphasis is in the wrong place. Perhaps this came across to them as a form of mimicry. Right? Perhaps a form of cultural mimicry. They're like, how can this person take up our entire culture and say that he is our God? The Jews got caught up with their theological narrow-mindedness. And they missed the opportunity to behold Jesus. The perfect mimic of God. Sometimes I feel very jealous of the first generation uh, Christians, right? Those who were around Jesus. They got to see, they got to hear, and whether they did it or not, they at least got to see Jesus from close quarters. This is indeed the one they have been waiting for, but they just missed an opportunity. Jesus then responds in the passage we read, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except me. I have seen the Father, and if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus, the true mimic of God. And yet, it is difficult for us to follow God, follow Jesus. Now as we turn to Ephesians, Paul's invitation here is explicitly to be imitators of God. And he makes it even more simple. He just says, just do Jesus. Just be like Jesus. Paul is very clear in saying that we need to be like Jesus who loves us and who gave himself up for us. 
as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And look at these challenging but yet joyful things. Let me also remind you that Ephesians is a book that teaches us how to be a church. How to be a church. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor. Be angry, but do not sin. And my favorite, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Sonia holds, a, if, if we fight overnight, I wake up in the morning and I, 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 I'm like, I just don't want to deal with it. I just forget it. Um, do not let the sun go down on your anger. It's a great principle. <laughs> do not make room for the devil, the deceiver, the one who confuses. Those who steal must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor doing good work. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Put away from yourself all bitterness. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. It's probably divine providence that as I was preparing, I, I was reminded of the story of Sadhu Sundar Singh. We heard a testimony of um, a member amidst us to encourage us. Sadhu Sundar Singh was a 20th century evangelical Christian. He was famous to have been converted to Christianity and he, um, he had his own ways of expressing Christianity, but he was a Sikh person and he, uh, the story goes that he studied in a uh, Christian school, but he did not really take to the Christian way of life. Uh, perhaps it was not modeled to him well, to the extent that at one point, he actually burned the New Testament that he uh, used, to be, used to read in school. They were, uh, at that point, um, every school had the New Testament uh, read. Now, as things went on, a big tragedy hit him. His mother passed away. He was very, very close to his mother and he lost his sense and purpose of life. And he one night said that if there is a true God, I want that God to reveal um, the God self to me. And it so happened as we know, as most of us know, that one evening, or one night, the Lord appeared to Sadhu Sundar Singh, to Sundar Singh. Uh, and he had his, uh, he could recognize that it was Jesus because he saw the wounds on the palm of, of the hands of this vision of, of the Lord who appeared. From that point on, his life transformed. And he went on to, even today we, we, we consider him a great icon, a Christian icon. The Lord appears to us even today. So we need to remind ourselves that in our, um, in, 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 as we aspire to mimic or be imitators of God, we, yes, we do not have the privilege of knowing Jesus firsthand, but we have the Gospels. We have the Spirit of God that helps us understand Jesus. And we must yearn to see God. Following Jesus is probably an act of mimicry. It is a call to sometimes become troublemakers when there needs to be somebody who stands in the gap. It's a call sometimes to be revolutionaries like Sadhu Sundar Singh. It's a call sometimes to be seekers of change and agents of transformation for justice and peace in our world. It's a call, but at the same time, it's a challenge. But friends, we have the Lord's Spirit with us. Let us aspire to see, to hear, and to do Jesus Christ. 
May the Lord add his blessings to this word.